Listen, however you look at it, we're in a battle. We are in a battle. We're in a battle for God, in a battle for country, in a battle for faith, in a battle for our families, in a battle for the Bible. Amen. Uh, Pastor Cooley has, uh, he's, at, he's run several ideas by me. And one of the things that he sees in this battle over the Bible is how the softening of these new translations has enabled this whole sodomite transgender movement to not just flourish outside the walls of churches, but flourish inside the walls of churches. And I've said this, man, I've been 10, 15, 20 years when it really started occurring to me that churches were transitioning, that a soft stand on the issue of sodomy today turns into an acceptance of sodomy, which then turns into a commandment that you must approve their life. Now, I live my life how I believe God leads me to live my life. I don't care if other people approve it or not. I don't need everybody's acceptance of it. If they don't like it, they can leave me alone and not participate with me in anything at all. And I'm okay with that. But for some reason, the other side does not see it that way. They feel like they must get everybody's acceptance of what it is, how they live their life, and what it is they believe. But if you ask them, do you need my approval? We don't need your approval. Then why are you shaping all the laws and all the, all the ideas in corporations, how you cannot say certain things? Schools, you cannot say certain things. Places of business, you cannot say certain things. Facebook, Facebook has come out and with a very hard stand against anybody who makes any kind of derogatory comment about the whole transsexual uh, issue. They're coming out and saying, we're going to ban you from Facebook if you say anything against these people. What? Do we not have a right to speech? Well, they would say we do as long as we don't use Facebook. Okay, if you want to kick me off, that's fine. I'm still going to say what I think God tells me to say, whether Facebook allows me to say it on their playground or not. It's their playground. They have a right. But I'm still going to say it no matter what. Amen? God created us. Amen? God created us. Genesis chapter 1. That's the idea. That's the key. Uh, by the way, Ron asked me for the notes that I'm using uh, for this. I have the PowerPoint uh, and I printed it out for him. If anybody else would like for me to print it out for you, uh, I'll do that. It's no big deal. Uh, if we can remember it tomorrow when we post these sermons, Sermon Audio will let me take my PowerPoint, make it a PDF and upload it with the sermon so people can have the notes along with it. But one of the things I like about what we're doing is that if they watch the video, it's there on the screen, all the verses I'm using and so on. All right. Genesis chapter one. Let's read several verses. Let's read of the first day of the creation. And then we'll kind of get into a little bit of what we were talking about last Sunday night is God's purpose of creation. What, what did God, what, what was God thinking? In other words, why did he do this? Knowing that there would be so much grief, so much heartache, so much of God actually repenting that he made man on the earth. Why then did he do this? And we get the clues from the scriptures. So Genesis chapter one, verse one. In fact, let's read the first five verses out loud as just sort of our, our unison reading of scriptures. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, 
and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. He's telling you it was 24 hours. Not 24 million hundred years. It's 24 hours. That's a, that's a powerful God. To create everything that is in a moment out of absolutely nothing. So why do we believe that? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would bless tonight as we open up your word. And Father, we thank you, God, that all the mysteries and secrets of who you are, why you've done what you've done, why you do what you do. Lord, those things are revealed to us and to our children because you have set your love upon us and we have fixed our minds and our hearts upon you. We believe that you are God. You alone are God. And there is no other God beside you. There's no other God as powerful as you. There is no God that can create what you created out of absolutely nothing. The devil might have the power to corrupt what you created. But God, you have the power to recreate it, make it better than it ever was. And Father, that's what we believe. I pray, dear God, that you would establish our hearts in truth and help us to understand, God, in the face of all of the lies that are being spread, even by some of the most intelligent men and women on this earth. Father, when they do not accept you as creator, then their science is going to be wrong. And I pray, dear God, that you have truly chosen the foolish of the world and will use us to confound the wisdom of the wise of this world. So Father, we thank you, God, that we are nothing as far as this world's concerned. We're not the scientists, the geologists, the astronomers. We're not the physicists. Father, we're just plain, simple people that believe what you said. So Father, we pray, God, that as we study your word, that you would give us light and understanding of this universe, of your creation, how it works, and why you put us here, so that we can have an answer for everyone that asks us these questions. Father, just fill us with knowledge, and with that knowledge, give us understanding, and then give us wisdom in our lives. We ask your blessings now upon your word. Be, Father, again, with those that are sick tonight, Sister Linda Toomey, we ask God that you bless her. And Father, we just pray, God, that you would take her out of that ICU unit, Give her her mind and her heart back. Give her her health back. Rid her of the disease that she has. I pray, dear God, that you'd give her healing tonight. We love her very much. And Father, we miss her voice of testimony here in this place. So Father, bless her and be with her tonight and others, we pray. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. amen. Uh, turn to um, Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. Uh, we touched on this a little bit last Sunday night, and I'm just going to start from here and move on about how God did, in fact, create. When, when, he, when he said in Genesis 1, God created the heaven and the earth, in those two things is everything, the heaven and the earth. And, and John and I were discussing uh, earlier, we're trying, to, we're trying to be smart, and it's not working out too well. But we're trying to understand the universe as it is, as science says it is. I believe there's a sun up there and a moon and stars. I believe in the open firmament, not a we're not in a fishbowl, we're not in an um, ice dome, snow globe. We're not in anything like that. The firmament that God put everything in is wide open. And the Bible says he stretched it out and it's still stretching, okay? Because they can see the stars moving. And if a star is, let's say, a thousand light years from here and it moves barely a millimeter, how much is a millimeter? 
when you take it and expand it out to a thousand light years away, how far is that? That's a lot. I don't know how much, I don't know the math on it, but it's a lot. So they know that it's still being stretched out. And I believe that because the Bible allows me to believe that. We are trying to understand the nature of the universe. I do believe that the earth, in the midst of this humongous universe, the earth is the center and the focus and the bottom of everything that is. Everything is above us, no matter where you are on the earth. And the earth is the focus of everything that God does in this creation. I absolutely believe that. And I don't believe that little men on Mars live with a different idea of who God is. C.S. Lewis believed that. He wrote about it. Okay? And I don't believe there's people on other planets who have a different Bible and a different concept of God. And God is, loves them just as much. See, that Vatican says stuff like that. But you don't see that in the Bible. You see the earth, the heavens, and God. And that's it. So that's what I believe. So Isaiah 43, 15, I'm the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your king. So if God is creator, he's the king. Uh, verse Chapter 45, verse 6, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. Now, something else I'm going to throw in here that we were talking about. Think about this, Jared. The sun rises every day and the sun sets every day for us here in this spot. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He said he was both at the same time. And I never really thought about this until today. But the sun literally is rising someplace in the earth every second. And the sun is also going down someplace in the earth every second. And the sun is at high noon, someplace in the earth, every second, and it's at midnight, the middle of the night, every second of every day, Jesus is both the beginning and the ending, simultaneously, at the same time, and only Jesus can do that. That's what I believe. Isaiah 45, 18. Thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. Notice that we have the heavens and the earth. He's not describing anything else beyond that. The heavens and the earth. And, and had made it. He hath established it. Meaning that he's put it there. It's not going anywhere. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Now Isaiah 65. This is where we got into the new heaven and the new earth. And here we get into really the very nature of God. Isaiah 65, I want you to turn there. Because this, to me, really, really starts to get the idea of what God was thinking. Because some people might say, well, I believe in God. I believe He created everything. And everything that is continues on. And at the end of life... That's it. There's nothing else. Well, they got it half. They're halfway there. So Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. Now, Right now, Jerusalem is far from this. Jerusalem is a very violent place. It is a divided city. You have the Muslim quarter. You have the Christian quarter. You have the Jewish quarter. That's three quarters. I don't know what the other quarter is. Probably the atheist or the sodomite quarter. But Jerusalem right now is a, is a dangerous place. If you are from a certain bloodline and you go into the wrong neighborhood, you're in danger no matter who you are. So he's talking about a different Jerusalem because we know them that God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. In fact, turn to Isaiah 66, the next chapter over. 
because he mentions, uh, let's see here, where is it? Verse, oh, where does he mention the new heaven and new earth in, in chapter 66? I know it's here somewhere, or I thought it was here. Verse 22, how did I not see that? Yeah, verse 22, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. So the idea of God's creation is he didn't just create it and then pull back and say, you're on your own. And however you live life is up to you. Make what of it what you want. Do some good. Then you die and it's all over with. That's not God. We now learn that God has yet a better creation, a better one, far superior. So now we see the nature of God. If he does something once, we know that God will do it again. Christ came once and then we have the promise of Christ coming again to this earth. Once he does that, then he's going to reign a thousand years. Then God is going to establish a new heavens and a new earth. And God himself then will be seen by all of his creation. Right now, the very face of God is hidden from this creation. It's because this creation cannot stand it. But, but we see the face of Christ. And so that is the face of God. But in the new heaven and the new earth, we will then see the very face of almighty God and live through it and like it. So now we see the nature of God. What God does once, God will always do it a second time. He gave Israel a covenant, but that was only his first covenant. The second covenant is better than the first covenant because the second covenant is based upon faith. The first one's built upon works. God gave you a birth, but when God gave you a birth, he's not done. He's given you the opportunity to have a second birth. And that second birth I promise you, is going to be far better than your first one. You won't go into the second one crying like a little baby. You're going to be happy. You're going to be full of joy. You're going to have a new body. You're going to live in heaven for all of eternity. You're going to be able to travel anywhere that you want to go at any time for any reason and have it all. Amen. So that's the nature of God. God is a creating God. But what he does once, he'll do it again. Amen? So now we're getting the idea and the nature of God. Uh, Ezekiel 28. Turn there very quickly. Ezekiel 28. And then we're going to answer a question that somebody asked me when I was probably 16 years old. An adult asked me. Um, it was an old friend of my mom's that knew me as a little boy. They came up to visit my mom and dad from Louisiana. And they, were, they knew that I had been uh, surrendered to preach. So I was supposedly the Bible expert. And they asked me the question, because they asked their pastor this question. Pastor, what about all these people in the Amazon jungle who've lived in this little community for thousands of years, never had contact with outside man, never known about a Bible, never knew about God, never knew about anything... Will they go to heaven? And before I could answer, they said, well, our pastor said, since they didn't know anything, God can't hold them accountable. So naturally they'll get to go to heaven. They won't go to hell. And it didn't sound right to me. It didn't sound right. Because if by not knowing anything, people can automatically go to heaven, why not God just keep his mouth shut, not tell anybody anything, and then they get a free ticket to heaven, no matter what they do. Now granted, you understand that these tribes like that, there's, there's something that indicates their spiritual condition. And I'm being dead serious. Is that normally, these little isolated tribes that have had no contact with outside world for hundreds of years, they don't wear clothes. For the most part, they do not wear clothing. Now to me, that indicates something. Because we know that 
Adam and Eve were naked, but then when Eve ate the fruit, and Adam did, then their eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked, okay? And these people are grown adults, but they are naked to their own shame. Are they not still the offspring of Adam? Yes. And so with that comes the knowledge of good and evil. So I think, and I'm going to read scripture to back this up. I think at some point, somehow in their mind and heart, what they knew about God, they rejected. Now, I'm not them, so I can't tell you how it works, but that's what I believe the Bible says. Ezekiel 28, very quickly, verse 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say to him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the psalm full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Who is this talking about? Anybody know? Lucifer, Satan, the dragon, the serpent. Uh, it says in verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. That tells you something. The serpent was in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. And he mentions ten stones here. The sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, the emerald, carbuncle, and gold. Now, understand this. Um, we, human beings, are made up of, literally, the minerals that are in the earth. The dust. And dust is minerals. We have iron, Carbon, nitrogen, potassium. What else do we have in us? Calcium. Maybe a tiny amount of gold in us. Tiny, tiny, tiny amount. It's not worth killing anybody over. But we're made up of the stones of this earth. Lucifer is made up of these stones in heaven. Because that's what it says. These, this is his skin. His covering is these sardius, topaz, diamond, bear. We just have skin. But Lucifer, his skin is precious jewels. So he looks amazingly beautiful. You see, that was his downfall. Because, because of pride got in his heart. And it says... In also in verse 13, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes. Now he's not talking about tobacco pipes. He's talking about what? Musical organ. Musical pipes. Tabrets. Tambourines. Uh, 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 percussion instruments. Wind instruments. They were literally built into his body. And if that sounds strange, go out at night tonight. As the sun goes down and tell me what you hear. What are you going to hear? We're going to hear primarily frogs. Okay? Because it's their mating season. And they're out there crying because they don't have a date. Okay? But you're going to hear crickets. You're going to hear birds. God built. How do crickets make their sound? Their legs or in some cases their wings. So God built them with what do, uh, what do elk do? Bugle. God put a bugle inside of them. You can hear it for miles. So to me, that's not odd considering God made things on this earth in a similar way. So he's, he's a master of mu He's a master musician. Don't you ever forget that because he'll use music. Okay. And then he said, uh, uh, thou art the, and he said, the workmanship of thy tablets and the pipe prepared in thee the day that thou wast what? Created. He was made by God. He's the creature, not the creator. Very important to remember. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways. From the day, here he says it again, that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So everything, as I told you all ago, Everything that God does, he does twice. The first time he does it is good, but the second time he does it is amazing. It's the opposite with Satan. The first time with Satan is good, but after that, it goes downhill. Now, how many of y'all know that from experience? First time you ever got drunk. First time you ever got high. 
First time you ever said something. First time for a lot of things. It was amazing. And after that, it all goes downhill. It turns into corruption every single time. But Lucifer was created. Now, he's the creature. Turn to Romans 1. Let's spend a little time here. Let's look at how God answers the question. Does these tribes of people who have never had contact... Now, here's the question to ask. Could God have worked it out to send somebody in there to show them the gospel? Well, he made it to you, did he? He made it your way. You lived in a different jungle. But the gospel made it your way. God knows how to make the wind blow wherever. And that's what he was, Jesus was telling Nicodemus about the spirit. The, wind, the spirit bloweth wherever, wherever it wants to go. God knows how to make the gospel go wherever he wants it to go. So let's read this and I'll tell you what I think. Romans 1 verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So those who are justified in Christ and have the forgiveness of sins so that we can be in heaven, those who are justified live by faith. They believe who God is and they believe it right. God has some way of conveying that to the heart of every man. I believe. Now verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So there it says all ungodliness and, un and unrighteousness of men. Who hold the truth. How? In unrighteousness. I think there must be something in them that knows the truth. But they disregard it because of their unrighteousness. Because, verse 19, that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath shewed it unto them. Now, I don't know how that works. I know that God arranged for me to make an intersection in life with the cross of Jesus Christ. God is the one who brought me to that point to where I met Jesus at his cross. That I know. How God shows those people or, you know... There was somebody, I'll say it this way, there was somebody here today who is not a Bible-believing Christian. But my hope and my prayer is that at some point, he will become a Bible-believing Christian. Okay? How does God show it to them? Well, here's what it says. Verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, I, I know it's interesting when you look in, back in Genesis chapter 1, turn there. At verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And what you have in verse 1 is basically the makeup of everything that is. Number 1, it starts out with in the beginning. You cannot have matter without time. There is something scientists understand, kind of, I don't understand it, but they tell us that there is what's called the um, temporal spatial constant or something like that. That time and the space we live in are related to each other. Okay? And I don't understand that, but that's what they're saying it is. So, but I know from Genesis 1 that before God created the heaven and the earth, He created time for it to dwell in. Linear time. 
Time, we understand time, but we don't understand anything outside of time. We have no comprehension of it. But everything that God put in this universe is by time. And time comes in three forms. Past, present, future. And God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But then he created, in the beginning, God created the heaven. So that is all the space that everything exists in. And space is in three dimensions, width, length, and depth. Three. Then he said, created the heaven and the earth. And that's all the matter that we have. The ground, the trees, the iron, the gold, the silver, the clouds, the water. Everything that exists, exists in space and in time. And matter happens to come in three forms. Solid, liquid, and gas. So we have time, past, present, future, space, length, width, and depth, and matter is solid, liquid, and gas. So you have three things that exist in three different forms, and that's how they exist, and God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And that's, look at what he's saying. He said, even his eternal power and Godhead. Godhead means the, the, what they call the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. So that they are without excuse. So, the Bible would say that they know or on a very base level are introduced to God in the course of their life. But God said they reject it. And here's what they do. Um, verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. So instead of worshiping the creator of the sun, they worship what? The sun. And every, every civilization on the earth worshiped the sun. And some still do. Instead of worshiping the creator of the stars, they worship the stars. And every civilization has the gods that live up in the heavens. So that's what he's saying here. They, they glorified not as God, neither were thankful, became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image. So likewise, not only did they worship the sun, they made an image of a God that they called the solar deity or the sun God. Whether it was Osiris in Egypt or Baal in, in Babylon or it was Helios with the Greeks or wherever it was, if they had a sun God, which they all did, then they all made an idol, a man idol out of that sun God, put a big sun behind his head to make him look like he's the sun and they bowed and they worshiped that. What they did was they corrupted who God is and who Jesus is. They corrupted it. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like an incorruptible man, to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. So, with the false religions comes the immorality. Uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served who? The creature. And who do we just say back in Ezekiel 28 was the creature? Satan. He's the creature that they worship. And he is amongst all of the creation. Lucifer is the ultimate little g God. There's none above him. He is, as Paul said, the God of this world. And so man, having a choice, serving the creator or serving the creature. Now here's what I believe. I absolutely believe that no matter when, and no matter who it would have been, who really cried out 
and said, all of these other gods and my fathers, I don't believe them. I believe there is a God beyond all of that who made everything and I want to know him. I believe God would have come down somehow, some way and shown himself to that person. And think of Pastor Lordson Rock who's come here to preach. I love that man. I love him so much because he grew up in an idolatrous home. Mother worshiping idols. Grew up in the, he was a slum dog. Okay? In one of some of these Indian slums. And yet, at some point in his life, he said, I don't want Shiva, I don't want Brahma, I don't want Shakti, I don't want 330 million gods to try to make happy. I want to know the one God. And God was faithful enough to show himself to that man. So that's what I believe. So is God going to hold all of these other nations accountable? Absolutely. Because at some point, they in their life had a choice. They made it. And God sealed that for them. Okay? Who changed the truth of God into lie and worship and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forevermore. Amen. And then I'll leave you with this. Turn to Ephesians. Mm, 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 mm. Ephesians chapter 2. Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd, Thessalonians. Who knows that song besides me? Sweetie Pie. 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy. All right, Ephesians 2. Let's read verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For... We are his workmanship, created, created. You're, it's a, but it's a new creation now. Because remember, what God does, he does twice. Even the damned, even those who reject God all their life, God's going to give them a new body. Prepared specifically to burn in the lake of fire for eternity. Isn't that a bummer? <laughs> And I, I like it this way. I'm going to get a new body prepared specifically to worship God and to be able to sing. Not only sing forever, but eat while I'm doing it. Forever. Amen. Never get old. So we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath or before ordained that we should walk in them. And so, Roy's not here, but I would say to Roy... Roy's got a lot on his mind. So does Janice, dealing with Linda. They have a lot to worry about. And I would say, and I know this how hard this is, but I would say, God gave us one day only. We have this day. Whatever comes this way was God's will for that day. Now, God already has tomorrow worked out. And the solution to every problem for tomorrow already worked out. Because that's how big God is. Remember, God is the one who can take an infinity and cut it into thirds. And nobody else can do that. So God has already the solutions to every problem already worked out. And I'm, I'm really trying at this stage in my life to think of my life as only one day at a time, which is this day right here. And then tomorrow, God is going to direct my paths for tomorrow and show me the way that he wants me to go. And whatever happens to me tomorrow was God's creation for that day. See, the Bible says we have a new man inside of us. And that new man is renewed every single day. It's created. 
just as when we go to sleep at night, we wake up in the morning, God has created, recreated us, and He's made a brand new day for us to get involved with, for us to follow His path and to learn what He has in store for us this day. So really, why should we worry about what's going to happen a month from now? Now, that doesn't say anything against preparation. <clears throat> Saving money is a good idea, is it not? Okay. Um, you know, not throwing away things that you might need. Because you never know, Sterling. There's an object in your shed you haven't touched in 12 and a half years. But don't throw it away. Because a year and a half and six days and 12 hours from now, you're going to go, hey, I need that. And it'll be there. Amen? Or go ahead and throw it away. And all of a sudden, you'll end up with another one. I don't know, but that's, that's just how God works. God's got it all right here. He created it. It's all in his hands. Amen. Um, one more. Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart. I don't like where my heart goes. From time to time. I don't like it. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So if we believe that God created everything out of nothing, then absolutely we can believe that God can create in us a clean heart. A heart that just one day just doesn't want to do the things that it used to do. I believe that. I believe that. I've experienced it. I've had it happen. And I'm glad God's done that for me. And God will do the same thing for you. Because He's a creator God. That's His primary role in this universe is to create. And He's not done creating. He'll create a new day, a new heart, a new life, everything. Behold, I make all things new, He said. Amen.